is six twenty six. So that's our four minute. Uh, yeah. Check. It also means uh, so I'm Linda, ready. Sorry, I was just going to ask Linda Brick uh, while we still have a few minutes here. How are things in the new? Uh, just make sure we keep our microphones muted if we're not the ones that are presenting, and uh, we should be good to go. Uh, just make sure we keep our microphones muted if we're not the ones that are presenting and uh, we should be good to go. 
So good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's public information session, today being February 10th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. Uh, my name is Ben Morgan, and I'm happy to uh, welcome uh, our panelists and our mayor and council into the uh, the teams group and acknowledge uh, that we are... And then acknowledge that we are live streaming to YouTube to create space for residents of Merritt to join us so that they can hear the conversation today. I'd like to uh, invite Mayor Brown to uh, welcome us all, uh, and then we will begin with uh, some presentations. Mayor Brown. Thank you, Ben. Good evening. I'm Mayor Linda Brown, and on behalf of Council, I'd like to welcome you to the City of Merritt's public information session dated February 10th, uh, 2022. We'd like to begin this session by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territories of the Inca Kapma and Silk peoples. I also want to acknowledge that the majority of Merritt Council is also on this virtual session and Jackie Taggart, MLA, um, has asked me to give her uh, regrets. Um, she has come down uh, with an illness. The city has recently faced the most catastrophic disaster ever to hit the city, and although the evacuation order has been lifted a while back, many people still have not returned to their homes. Many residents are still in need of emergency funding. We hope to address your concerns on available supports and updates on the recent recovery efforts. I'll now turn the session back over to our MC, Ben Morgan. Ben? Thank you, Mayor Brown. Indeed, this was such a, a devastating event, and it is uh, warming, however, to see some of the great work that is being done uh, by folks within the City of Merritt and the partnerships with uh, really important uh, collaborative partners like the Red Cross and Emergency Management BC. Uh, if I can uh, introduce Mr. Greg Selecki from the City of Merritt, uh, Recovery Operations Manager. Uh, Greg, if you can provide an update with, with where the recovery team is at and, and maybe some highlights for us of the work that's being done. Thanks, Ben. Really appreciate that. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. It's important that we have these information sessions and get to share some of ours, uh, our information and anything new that's coming along from you. I, I wanted to just frame a little bit of our team that's in place and uh, speak to some of the sections and areas that they're working in uh, within the city of Merritt. And one big one is our critical infrastructure section. And what that group does is looks at uh, infrastructure like roadways, pathways, sidewalks, the bridge, the dikes, uh, and considers some of the more important pieces as well to the community side, which is parks and paths and things that get us all out and get us going and moving around. Of course, one of the other areas, though, that are uh, very important and likely uh, our most important is the people portion of this, where we, we have a health and wellness uh, section in place. Uh, that's where the support center also resides. And you'll hear from Linda Brick in a little bit after I'm done. But we really uh, need uh, you folks, uh, some evacuees, if you know some, to continue to move into the support center to provide the information that you may have so that we may be able to provide the supports that you need. Working with a lot of great partners that Ben already mentioned, the Red Cross, Rotary Club, and many, many others, United Way, uh, to help us make that connection with you and provide you the resources that you may need. Um, one of the big uh, items uh, that uh, align with that is our housing section. Uh, a lot of people are wondering, uh, and of course, Red Cross will be speaking to us as well tonight, but uh, what what happens with the, the housing? Uh, a lot of housing questions in place, uh, temporary housing, affordable housing. So we have a group there as well that's working with our partners in the provincial government to identify and, and look at all the different options available or that may be available uh, to put in place for temporary housing or short-term affordable housing or long-term affordable housing as well. So we put all those together and we also have uh, a pretty good community liaison group in place. Not only do we have people embedded uh, from the support center, but we uh, want to recognize 
uh, how important the region is and looking with the uh, looking at the First Nations that are all around us and Indigenous uh, to work with them as well. And uh, when we're making some of these decisions or when we get to the point where we make some decisions, we want to include the community and also the surrounding communities. One of the obstacles we've had already uh, was trying to uh, navigate through where a lot of our residents had to go during the evacuation. Uh, we were able to work with, uh, again, some of the non-government organizations, even uh, Q101, uh, trying to get the information out to Kelowna, Kamloops, Salmon Arm, Princeton, where we knew there were Maritonians, to let them know that we had the support center in place and we had the opportunities for them to come in, uh, let us know what they need, let us know what you need so that the resources could be aligned with with some of those needs. Uh, we, we, we had a bit of a good success there, right? We're able now to bring people back into Merit um, and uh, get that uh, information that we need, gather that information. It helps us make better decisions. And there are going to be more of these, obviously, where we have these information sessions and hear from you so that we can continue to make uh, good decisions all the way around. Uh, I think that's about it for me, Ben. Thank you very much. And thanks again for organizing this. We'll see you many more times. I'm sure we will, Greg. Thank you. And I know that, uh, you know, information is is worth its weight in gold, especially when people are feeling what they're feeling and, and looking for answers. And I know that uh, you and your colleagues at the city have made that commitment to share information as it comes available. Uh, you know, it can't come fast enough for many people, uh, but as as things are moving, uh, there's a commitment to deliver that communication and share it with, with your community. And so that's, uh, it's great that you're joining us tonight. Uh, Ms. Linda Brick is the uh, Support Center Manager, the Support Center in Merit, an incredible resource for people that are still uh, feeling the impact of the, of the flood. And uh, there's a great deal of resources there that are available to folks. So, Linda, if you can talk a little bit about, you've got a new center. Um, where is it? What can people access there? And how's it been going there so far? Thank you so much, Ben. As Ben mentioned, my name is Linda Brick, and I'm the manager here at the Merit Support Center. We have relocated. We are now at 102 1700 Garcia Street, which is in the Rail Yard Mall. This location um, is very central, so it provides an opportunity for residents who are coming into town from out of town to do some shopping at the same time as come in and visit us. So it's, I feel it's a really good location for residents to come in and visit us. The support center, the purpose of the support center is to support the health and wellness of the community. So we're co-located with the Red Cross. Um, we also have disaster financial assistance here to be able to for residents to come in and if they have any questions about the application form they can come in and talk to Stephen who's here every day with us. Um, we have a health emergency BC that's here with us so if any residents are feeling like they need someone to talk to or having a day where they just need to sit down and kind of talk through the process we've got people here that can support that as well for them. And of course, we've got our City of Merit caseworkers that are here too. The Red Cross has got caseworkers and the City of Merit's got caseworkers. We're working together to make sure that we can really provide as many supports to residents as possible. The Red Cross has some great resources. We also have other resources from other nonprofit organizations that we can connect residents with to meet all of the needs or as many of the needs as we possibly can. So if you come in and visit us um, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. daily, I'm actually going to share my screen so that I can share our telephone number as well as our location. So we're at the Merit Support Centre and it's 102 1700 Garcia Street. And the telephone number is 1-877-655-0341 and we're open 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. daily. So please come in and visit us and come in for a cup of coffee, have a chat with us and see how we can support you and help Merit come home. So that's what we're all about and that's where we're at. We're looking forward to seeing you soon. So I'll turn this back over to you, Ben. Thank you so much. Thanks, Linda. And it's so great that that type of center is available and 
if you're not sure what kind of resources are available there, drop in and ask or uh, give them a phone call and ask. And chances are, if they don't have the resources in place to help answer your question or get you pointed in the right direction, they can work with you to find out where to, where and who to connect you with uh, the, that makes the most sense for your needs. So it's, uh, it's a great resource to have there. So thanks for, for running that, Linda. Uh, Nadine Madsen from the Government of BC is joining us tonight to provide an update on disaster and financial assistance. So Linda, if you could walk us through where, where the Government of British Columbia is at with, with the DFA process. Hi everyone, I'm Nadine Madsen. Um, I have a presentation, um, I will share my screen and so you can all see. So I'm just gonna give a quick overview about our program and general information for everyone who's been affected by the floods. Okay, hoping everyone can see that okay. So this is the Disaster Financial Assistance Program through the province of BC. So the Disaster Financial Assistance Program is a funding agency um, that's legislated by the Emergency Program Act. Um, we're governed by our Compensation and Disaster Financial Assistance Regulations. Um, these regulations guide how we deliver the program and who is eligible under our program. Uh, DFA is a helping hand for damages where insurance was not available. So we aren't going to be able to compensate for 100% of what was lost, but we're there to replace the essentials. Um, DFA has a $1,000 deductible and covers 80% of eligible costs up to a maximum of $300,000. So these are the general steps to apply for a program. And after, after this slide, I will take you through um, where to find our resources on our website. Um, so the first step to apply is to confirm that the date in the area has been a declared event. So um, for the City of Merritt, um, it has been declared an event, so everyone in the City of Merritt is eligible to apply. Um, the, the event date for this flooding event um, is November 14th to December 2nd, 2021. Um, applicants are welcome to apply um, in one or two of the following categories, um, homeowners, residential tenants, small businesses, charities, and usually farm owners. However, recently, just this week actually, it was announced that the Ministry of Agriculture has stood up a, a brand new um, flood recovery program called the 2021 um, Canada BC Flood Recovery for Food Security Program. So this program, is specifically designed for agricultural producers um, that have been affected by the flood event um, in 2021. So any applications for farms that we have received previously or that we will receive in the future, we are automatically transferring the files over to this program to, um, to cover those damages. Um, so once you establish what category you're applying for, um, you need to complete and submit an application to us before our deadline, which is March 3rd, 2022. Um, our applications are available on our website, which I will show you how to access. Um, the steps that um, take place um, once you send in your application is first we review your file for eligibility under our criteria. So each applicant category has its own set of eligibility requirements under our regulations. Um, so for example, for homeowners and residential tenants, the property that was damaged has to be your primary residence at the time that the flood occurred. Um, for small businesses, the income from your small business has to make up the majority of your income. Um, those are not all the eligibility requirements and I encourage everybody to go on our website, read through our DFA private sector guidelines or our um, compensation and disaster financial assistance regulations to um, get an, under an understanding of what the eligibility requirements are for each applicant category. 
So once we establish eligibility under our applicant criteria, we then assign the file to our field evaluator who will contact you um, and usually set up an appointment to visit the property in person to assess the damages. And then they will create a report and come up with an estimate of eligible costs. That report is sent back to us at the DFA office. And then if eligible, um, we will send payment out to you um, in the form of a check. So the easiest way to access our website is um, just searching on a search engine like Google. If you type in DFA BC, um, it should be the first search result that comes up. And once you get to our website, this is what our page looks like. So um, if you scroll down, um, it tells you, gives you general steps of how to apply um, information about the event um, date, date range and locations that have been declared. Um, we have our applications on the website. So we have two different types of applications. One is for a homeowner and a residential tenant, and the other is for a small business farm and a charity. Um, you can submit applications to us um, via email. Our email is dfa at gov.bc.ca. I have all of our contact information here. It's also available on the website and on the applications. Um, you are also welcome to mail your applications into us or fax them. Um, so yeah, I have our email here. And in addition, we have a toll-free line, 1-888-257-4777. Um, and encourage you to reach out um, if you have any questions about applying or specific questions about your specific situation. Um, give us a call or send us an email and we will um, get back to you with answers. So I do want to address um, the a couple specific questions that were sent to me. Um, so the first question is, um, if a DFA application was submitted prior to February 14th, but DFA does not receive the insurance template form before that date, is the application considered incomplete? So um, we don't require any, any um, requested documentation, including the insurance template form or any other documentation that we request to be um, submitted along with the application or before the application deadline. The only thing that we request is that you actually get your application into us. Um, really what we're looking for is just to have applicants contact us to let us know that you are reaching out and are considering applying for DFA. If you have sent in an email to us, if you have called and left a voicemail, if we have a record of you contacting us before the application deadline of March 3rd, 2022, we're able to accept your application. Once we get your application in, then we will contact you and work with you to request whatever documentation we need for your file. Um, and yeah, we will be in contact with you. So uh, the second question was, um, if applicants are having difficulty with their insurance company providing required um, documentation or letters, um, who should they contact for help? So we recommend contacting the Insurance Bureau of Canada for any, um, any difficulties with um, insurance representatives. Um, the toll-free line for the Western and Pacific regions um, for Insurance Bureau of Canada is 1-844. 227-5422. And lastly, um, will DFA be extending the 90-day post-flood deadline? Um, I guess there are some homeowners who have not yet submitted their applications because they were waiting to hear back from their insurance agents about whether or not their damages were going to be covered. Um, so the, the deadline had already been extended. Previously, the application deadline was February 12th, 2022. Um, it was extended because the, the date range for the DFA eligible event was actually extended. Originally, it was November 14th to 16th, and it was extended to November 14th to December 2nd. So because of that, the deadline was um, extended to March 3rd, 2022. Um, but we really encourage everybody to get your applications into us as soon as possible, even if you're still waiting to hear back from insurance, if you're not sure 
whether insurance is going to cover 100% of your damages, if it's going to cover some of your damages, if you're not sure, just get your applications into us. Um, once we get those in and we open a file for you, um, your file can be put on hold um, until you hear back from your insurance. So we want to make sure that everyone um, who needs DFA gets in before the application deadline. Um, yeah, so that is all for me. Thank you very much, Nadine, and, and thank you for the support to Merit residents from EMBC. Uh, you jumped the gun a little bit and answered all the questions uh, ahead of time, except there's one more lingering for you. Do you have to jet or are you uh, sticking around? No. Nope. Okay, great. We'll come back to you because we have one more for you. Okay. Uh, but it is important that we have the opportunity to hear um, from uh, the folks at the Canadian Red Cross. And so joining us tonight is Rachel Oliver and Sarah Howe from the Red Cross, uh, just to let us know what's happening uh, and and how the, the great work that they've been doing and the support that they've been offering, uh, where that's at and, and what we can be looking forward to moving forward. Yeah, thank you so much, Ben. Um, I'll just have Sarah share our slides. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to quickly introduce myself before I get started. Um, my name is Rachel Oliver. I'm a senior manager of recovery with the Canadian Red Cross. Um, and my uh, director, is Sarah Howe, um, she's the director of uh, recovery services uh, within the Canadian Red Cross. I also just wanted to acknowledge I'm really honored to be presenting to the residents of Merritt uh, this evening from the unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh Nation. So I know that lots of people are probably quite familiar with the Red Cross, um, but I just wanted to start us off tonight with introducing the Canadian Red Cross mission and as it's a core part of the work that we do day in and day out. Our mission is that we help people and communities in Canada and around the world in times of need and support them in strengthening their resilience. There are three core themes uh, within our approach and how we aim to work alongside individuals and communities. First off, we have strength-based, community-led, and non-duplication. So in terms of strength-based, we really look to recognize that people and communities are inherently resilient, each with their own individual strengths and capacities. The approach that we take is therefore that our programming intends to honor and amplify these existing strengths that are already existing. In terms of the community led as well as individual led, each community and individual is unique and we know that recovery is going to be extremely different for everyone, depending on a lot of different factors. Uh, so therefore, we really recognize that people and communities are the real experts in their own recovery and that they're the ones that have the best answers to the challenges that they face. It really is a partnership that we look to and we strive to develop um, with individuals and communities as we work alongside them throughout their recovery. And in terms of non-duplication, our programming and assistance really aims to avoid any duplication of existing resources and programming out there, including insurance and other assistance programming, such as um, Nadine's Disaster Financial Assistance Program. So since the start of February, our teams have been reaching out to individuals and began providing personalized recovery supports through case management to support those individuals who have been impacted by the flooding event and have identified recovery needs. As part of our personalized recovery supports, the Red Cross works directly with people to discuss their unique needs and help them navigate their recovery journey and access available supports. These supports that may be included within that could include establishing a personalized recovery plan, including a, a planning of re return home, navigating and sorting through various forms or complex processes that people may encounter as they go through their recovery, providing financial assistance um, to access mental health services, navigating and guiding the understanding of supports and assistance that may be available to individuals throughout their recovery journey and providing referrals and information to help people make decisions to inform their next steps. People who also haven't been able to return home 
um, or whose homes may have been impacted may also receive financial assistance um, towards their interim housing and basic needs. Um, I know there's been lots of questions around this um, from the residents and from um, the City of Merritt. So I just wanted to take a moment just to um, let them know that we have, um, uh, sorry, we understand that there are a lot of barriers um, that continue to impede people being able to re-enter their homes. Um, and we're looking to extend our existing housing supports and basic needs um, that we've um, provided to individuals from February 15th to the end of March 31st. And so we will be working with individuals um, to extend these supports for the commercial accommodations, building and food um, as appropriate for those who are eligible for those supports and are experiencing reasonable barriers um, to re-entry. We do anticipate that this will alleviate um, some of the immediate challenges that a significant number of people um, are experiencing within their recovery, including um, being able to find interim housing solutions. Um, we recognize this is not a long-term housing solution, um, but it does provide an opportunity for individuals and families um, some additional time in order to find some long-term housing solutions. The Red Cross is also providing a contribution towards expenses related to cleanup, relocation, and repair or rebuilding of their homes. Uh, and we recognize that not everyone is at this stage of their at this stage of their recovery as yet, but we'll work through this portion of the programming um, with individuals when they're ready. There are three ways um, that individuals can access um, or con connect with Red Cross supports. Um, the first is um, an email. Um, so we have our BC blood recovery at redcross.ca um, where individuals can connect in um, with their case managers if they've already been connected or identify any recovery needs that they may have. They can also contact our 1-800 number, so 1-800-863-6582, um, in order to be connected into those supports. And as Linda mentioned, we currently do have staff located within the Resiliency Center uh, within the city, and we're working on um, having case managers on the ground uh, starting next week, so people can go into the Resiliency Center and be able to speak to a case manager directly. And once um, people have been able to access in through those different channels, a uh, confidential uh, appointment will be arranged uh, with people to assess unique needs and discuss next steps. Um, we anticipate that due to ongoing COVID-19 um, issues within the city, a lot of appointments will take place over the phone or virtually. It's really depending on people's uh, comfort levels. And if people have not yet connected uh, in with case managers and you have any sort of unmet needs uh, related to recovery, we do encourage um, people to reach out through one of these avenues. So working with a case manager is really about the individual, their journey and their goals around recovery. A uh, case manager is really there to work with individuals to help them navigate their recovery experience in a way that makes sense to them, help individuals make informed choices, um, and help really to build that capacity and resilience for their own journey. Recovery can be an extremely long journey for many people, and so our case managers will work with individuals at their own pace. They'll help individuals access available resources and supports. And case managers are not ever going to take any steps without um, individuals first, making that choice to do so. It really is your recovery. The recovery process will look a little bit different for everyone. It really is a process, it's a series of discussions, um, and it's not that everyone will get, um, or everyone may not touch and on the same things um, within the first couple of sessions. Um, but we really do advocate for people if they have needs, especially if they're urgent needs, um, to identify that and advocate for those needs um, when they're discussing with their case manager. Um, and, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, just sorry, thanks. 
Um, we do know that uh, many Merit residents have already connected in with a case manager, um, but we really do encourage if you haven't heard from a case manager yet or haven't gotten connected in or you have additional needs, um, please do connect in with the Red Cross as soon as you can. When you do meet with a case manager, your conversation will essentially have a very similar look and feel. Um, every appointment will first uh, start with a discussion. It will have um, a form of assistance and then determination of next steps. In terms of that discussion, a case manager will look to provide emotional support uh, where appropriate and see how individuals are doing. Um, that will change obviously on a day to day as they try to navigate their journey. They'll try to understand some of the plans, uh, where resources exist or don't exist, um, and where their needs are at with respect to their recovery. With assistance, uh, the case managers will look to support individuals uh, to identify those pieces um, that you need to start um, to do in terms of planning and navigation, supports, providing, providing information, referrals, or uh, financial assistance. And in terms of next steps, uh, case managers will help with um, any sort of supporting documentation that individuals may need to support them moving forward uh, within the recovery, help identify some concrete actions um, that they could do in order to keep things moving forward, and identify a good time uh, to meet for an appointment. And this may be the following week, the following month. And again, it really just depends on where people are at and what makes sense for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel and Sarah, for joining us. And that sounds like uh, good news, essentially, for those that are uh, worried about, you know, what what's next. And so that extension sounds like uh, a really great step in in a in a proper direction. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I just want to address some of the questions, and and I just want to pick up on your presentation, Rachel. Uh, and, and I also want to acknowledge that we received uh, several several questions. A lot of them uh, had the same theme and were essentially asking the same thing. So if you're listening tonight and you don't hear your exact uh, question being addressed, it's because we're uh, we're trying to address them, you know, the like ones together. So the very similar type of questions, we've grouped those together. We may not have the opportunity to get to all of the questions tonight, uh, either for time or we don't have the right person uh, to answer your question with us tonight, uh, but we have got them. It's important to us that we get your questions answered. And so we'll either be addressing those questions in upcoming sessions or through conversations with the, with the folks at the uh, support center. So with that said, uh, Rachel, um, so you've just suggested that there's some changes and I gather it's not a blanket question uh, or sorry, not a blanket um, extension, but there's extension coming from the February 15th date through March 31st, depending on people's needs. And we know that some people are asking, okay, if, if there's an extension coming from the 15th, but I just can't meet with a Red Cross case worker until, you know, the 23rd, what happens in that gap period? Um, you know, how do, how do I get support uh, if I need support on the 15th without waiting until the 23rd? So how do people navigate that? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for the question, Ben. Um, so if people have urgent needs, um, specifically around housing, we really urge them to um, contact us as soon as they can. Um, we do have people dedicated to working with people who are having um, those types of needs in terms of interim housing or um, if they're staying in commercial lodging. Um, so we and again we we look for people to really advocate for their needs so um it could be that when people first were discussing um maybe it wasn't um clear to the case manager that they were in that type of circumstance um so we would really encourage them to call back in and 
and advocate um, that they're in a situation where they really need to be speaking with someone um, as soon as possible. And we will certainly uh, accommodate that and make sure that we're prioritizing it. Great. So, so call back or visit the support center, call the support center, do whatever you need to do to reach somebody um, at the Red Cross. And there's a multiple, uh, multiple different ways to do that is what I'm hearing. Absolutely. I did see uh, Councillor Chris Christopherson, you had your, your hand up. Was there something you wanted to, to ask, sir? Uh, thank you. I, and it's specifically to, to Rachel. I'm just rather worried or concerned. Do you think that you're getting a significant number of the applicants? Or do you think that there's a, a significant number out there that are falling between the cracks because they just aren't sure or have kind of given up? Uh, do you have a, a an understanding of, of how effective this is being? And sorry, um, Councillor Christopherson, um, just want to confirm uh, in terms of effective, um, in terms of what programming specifically are you referring to? Uh, more concerned with, with people with their housing needs. Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we've worked with everyone who has registered and identified um, their needs in terms of um, having barriers to accessing interim housing or um, are still um, not able to access their homes. Um, so in terms of people falling through the cracks, um, if they're reaching out and they have those needs, um, we're absolutely willing to work with them and, and wanting to support them. Um, so I would, I guess I would just encourage people um, if they're in need, please reach out to the Red Cross. We have supports available for them um, and we are looking for, for that. Yeah, I, I guess we're, we're told that we've probably got about 900 people. I'm not sure if that's a current number or not, but uh, that are still um, not home. And I don't expect that the Red Cross is going to be seeing all of those, but I'm wondering whether you feel that that uh, a significant number of people are being are reaching out for help through the Red Cross. Is it in the hundreds? Yeah, we do have um, we have close to ten thousand people registered, so we're definitely in contact with. With many many people, and what I would say is, um, we don't we don't expect that we're going to see everybody because everybody has different support systems and things like that. And we also know that um, people will like typically pop up at different times um, with different needs, um, and that's totally to be expected. And we're here for the long run, um, working alongside you. We've tried really hard to communicate through like lots of different channels and lots of different mechanisms. And what I would ask is. Um, if you have suggestions on ways we can reach people better, like we're super open to it. We've tried as, I think we've tried as many channels as we can right now, but we also understand it's really challenging when people aren't at home and they may not have their like normal communication channels and things like that. Yes. Th thank you very much. Um, I, I have a question for either Greg or, uh, or Linda, whoever's best to answer this one. But the question is about, um, can the city supply a structural engineer that can evaluate the damage done to our and many of the other uh, resident foundations, so the foundations of the home in zone four? Um, so, so is there support for like structural engineers to help with the evaluations? And, uh, and also, Curious to know uh, what's been done with the diking systems and if those are those are part of the plan of recovery and resiliency moving forward. Is that a is that a Greg question, Greg? Yeah, I can take that, Ben. Thanks. The, the, the short answer for the structural engineers is that uh, no, they won't come from the city, but uh, the homeowners would have to take that upon themselves to find uh, engineers, uh, other groups that would be in place to ensure the safety of their of their homes. The the second one with the diking is, um, yeah, I, I mean, we we we've we've done uh, a lot of information gathering. We're kind of in the discovery phase 
infrastructure is obviously a big component of what we're looking at and what we're doing. And one of the common threads and themes that will be uh, throughout uh, the questions and these info sessions is going to be, where are we with this uh, discovery phase, this information gathering? So um, th that's going to take a, a, a while, but there are teams of engineers looking at everything from the diking to where the river goes now, uh, how, what impact does that have on, on the banks and the bridges? Um, things of that nature. So uh, the, the dikes are in place. Uh, they're going to be able to maintain uh, what would normally come down for the spring runoff. Um, quite confident that uh, the information that we have already from engineering groups and uh, other data that's been gathered is that that will be maintained. Thanks, Greg. Hey, Greg, and while I have you and we're talking about structural engineering on basements and diking systems. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of silt and clay and mud uh, in people's properties, driveways, et cetera. Um, just trying to find the, the right question here. Yeah, I think I know what's coming, Ben, because we heard <laughs> today even that uh, um, there's reports from uh, the public works in, in Merritt that uh, people have resorted to putting silt and dirt and other things into the toilet and the drainage system. And that's just not going to help the system at all, obviously, and uh, definitely ask them not to do that. Uh, but then we understand that, okay, what, what are people supposed to do? And uh, to put it out uh, front or somewhere and gather somewhere else outside of the home is definitely what you want to do. And then the bigger question to that is uh, what uh, what's going on with the uh, silt mound and the the soil mound that was put in place and lined over by the airport and we're in between or we're right now planning for that uh, so that when we have large amounts in the residential neighborhoods uh, there will be a process in place uh, I'd like to say uh, by by next Thursday uh, of what that looks like and how that will be picked up, how that will be cleaned up, where it goes, and then uh, we will again determine what happens with that large amount after. So what I'm hearing then is that the removal of the, the clay, the silt, getting it out of the city is something that you're working on and, and hopefully we'll have some news on that tomorrow because it's not just a simple process. Oh, sorry, not tomorrow, next week. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. Uh, but it's it's just not a simple process. It's We have to be very mindful about where that's going, how it's getting there, the other impacts to landfill sites and all of that stuff. And as, as awkward as it is now with the weather warming up to look at this mud and we just want it gone, we need to make sure that we're doing it safely, responsibly, and not impacting other businesses down the line. Exactly. Yeah. And and just to reiterate, the 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 one thing we we really would uh, not like to see anymore is it going down the drains directly. Right. It's it's gathering it in a safe spot. Thank you. I want to go to Councillor Eckhart. I see your hand is up. Hi, uh, thank you for the information, especially on the silt. And I know a lot of people have questions about the banks and whatnot. Um, as I work in insurance, I see your DFA form every day, multiple times a day, constantly. Um, so what we get a lot of questions about, um, particularly for the senior citizens, is they're really concerned about getting back into the home. And they've been getting different information where they're really worried about um, some of the extra costs that it costs for them to be at, say, the Florentine, uh, some of the temporary housing that some of them have managed to find and um, how they're going to fund some of the immediate expenses because some of them are running quite low on funds and are quite concerned. I had that call actually just this afternoon. And so I did go next door to the support center and asked, well, actually it was yesterday. And they said, email the form uh, from the insurance side over to the DFA, which is done. So people are just wondering what would be the next process because some of these um, um, mobility challenged people have a little bit um, of a tougher time getting to the center and have a a tougher time maybe with the form. So I'm just wondering if you have any suggestion for those people. Is that a, a good question for Linda or Nadine? 
I'm thinking probably a me question. Um, so just to clarify your question, um, you're wondering like how best for people with mobility issues to get their insurance template form completed and sent back to us? Well, that that is done. Um, okay. But some of them are housed at the Florentine, but they still have to come up with the daily funds for the food. Is At least that's oh. what one of them told me. So with some of them being on a fixed pension, I think some of their funds are running a little bit low and they're a little concerned with payment. Right. Primarily. So, uh, yes, yes. So um, each file, it depends on, um, like each file we do deal with on a case-by-case -case basis because everyone's situation is a little bit different. Yes. So we're not able to give um, like definite timelines and especially with the nature of this event, just due to the size and the scale of it. Like we've never seen an event like this before. No. So we have thousands of applications. Um, so we are trying to expedite the process as much as possible. We've onboarded a lot of new staff um, and implemented some new processes to try and speed the, pro the, um, the timelines up for people as much as possible. Um, but once they do get their insurance template form back to us, um, generally, if we're talking about like a, a homeowner file, um, we need to get the insurance information. We need to confirm that it's their primary residence. Um, we need to confirm ownership of the home. Um, and there's some other little, little pieces. But generally, once we get an insurance template form back and we have been able to review the file thoroughly, um, then we can assign it to a field manager who then sets up a, a meeting to go and assess the, the damage in person. So um, usually once they get that form back to us, um, the process isn't too much longer until we can actually get someone out to the property and get it assessed and, and get them paid. But um, timelines are definitely more delayed in this event than they have been previously just due to how many people are in need in the province. Um, but yeah, I hope that that answers your question. It, it, it does for the home. I, mm. I think where the concern was is um, I, I didn't know that people were having to pay some of the facilities for the food separately. So that, that was the only thing I didn't know how to address. Right. right. So um, the bounds of our program are pretty rigid. So we are only able to compensate for actual property damage. Um, okay. we're, we're not able to look at anything like costs that are incurred, unfortunately, in the interim or yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, Nadine. Uh, I just know Mayor Brown has her hand up, and so let's uh, go ahead, Mayor Brown. On on the backs of uh, Councillor Itchart's um, question, mine is the food portion of that may not be at EMBC, but I suspect it's in uh, Red Cross area for looking at food for them while they're there. But there's also a great need in the community for housing and um, waiting for the ministry to approve our go ahead to be able to even bring housing into the community. Now that's going to take um, who knows when the, the funding approval is going to come down, but we still need a lead time on being able to order modular homes into the city. And we're looking at at least a three to four month lead time plus set up and competition with other communities. So um, we have uh, um, residents who are looking at the deadlines and saying, even then, thank you for the February 15th to March 31st, but what happens after that? Because we know that residents are not going to be able to go back to their own home. A lot of them aren't, and a lot of them are not going to be able to um, even find accommodation. So this is probably going to have to be maintained, but nobody's being told that it can extend beyond March 31st if and when we need it. So we've got a community out there that is just aching to find out what do they do next. And some of them are planning for a little bit longer than just a few weeks. So it would be nice to be able to assure them somehow, and I know we don't like that word assure, ensure, whatever, but even if uh, the needs are there that by March 31st, there may be more approvals down the line. Um, so that is one of my questions. And um, I had another question for the center as well. When you mentioned your daily nine to four, does that include Saturday and Sunday? 
Absolutely, it does. We want to make sure that we are here for residents when they need us. So we are open seven days a week. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome. And and can Sarah perhaps answer the question on what after what <laughs> happens after March 31st? I will do my best, um, but and we understand that no matter kind of where the deadline is, it's it's a stressor point for people and it will be because there's a lot of unknowns in people's world right now in terms of timelines to return home you know even the extent of like repairs that needs to be done there's just there's a lot of unknowns swirling around so we understand that there's a lot of anxieties um, about things right now what we can do is till March 31st um, in the period between now and March 31st, we're going to continue to work with individuals on what their plans are um, and also continue to hear the needs and the communities. We, we absolutely hear the housing shortages that Merritt is facing. Um, these are not easy problems to solve. They are not, you know, singular um, organization problems to solve. Um, and so we want to continue to be responsive as much as we can to um, to the the needs, the situation, the capacities that exist. And I think what we need to do is keep having the ongoing conversation so that we can work with you and understand sort of your um, potential other solutions for housing and the timelines on those and who's been able to maybe return home. Because we do know there are a couple of people that are uh, perhaps already on that path. Uh, people who may have been able to find something and then sort of work through um, kind of what's remaining. Um, so it's really hard to commit to or to ensure, I think you said, as to like what happens after March 31st. But we do commit to continuing to dialogue and continuing to work with you and continuing to hear the needs and do what we can. Um, and also to continue to work with um, EMBC on that work. Thank you. Thank, thanks for that, Sarah. Um, Mr. Crampton, I, I think you have something to add to to that uh, to that question. Yeah, I'll uh, introduce myself first. I'm Ray Crampton. I'm with the NBC. I'm an executive lead for um, Community Recovery Central Region. Uh, formerly, I was a district manager of FLNRORD, Okanagan Shushrot District. So Jen Reed's counterpart just over the hill coming to you this evening from Vernon, BC, the uh, uh, un unceded territory of the Seal Okanagan pe people, where I enjoy the opportunity to live, work, and play. Um, I just wanted to address, Mayor Brown and Council, the um, interim housing piece. The reason that government has not been able to provide, you know, ADCO trailers or something like that uh, to communities who have been impacted is because we don't have policy for that. And so um, BC Housing has uh, different tools in their toolbox for working with not-for-profits to provide um, temporary to longer-term housing for a number of different uh, types of people who endure hardship. And there's some middle-income um, housing uh, initiatives they, that they do. They work on about a five to 10-year budget with a whole bunch of stuff in there and a bunch of um, projects in different towns, all based on housing needs assessments that communities do annually. Um, they do not have, and the province does not have, a support system for providing housing short to medium to long term for evacuees from catastrophic events such as this. And so other than the interim housing, you know, and, and we are mindful that there's some 300 uh, residents living out of community right now, and they're tired of it. We get that. Um, this is why we're working with Greg and CAO Sean Smith on a housing committee. So we brought together um, BC Housing, Municipal Affairs, um, Ministry of um, uh, Attorney General's uh, Housing and, Constru and Construction Standards to work on creative solutions. And when I think of the partnership that we're bringing into that, it's everybody, it's it's the city, it's a number of the NGOs um, to, to talk about how we can get something together while government has in front of them the policy question on um, creating the ability to provide these supports. Um, thank you, I just need EMBC and the government to understand that this 
the, the residents are people. They are in transition. They probably don't care that you don't have policy for interim housing, but they are still in need, whether there is policy for it or not. And um, there is a fund that we should be able to access and are not able to access it at this point. And the longer we wait, the longer our residents are in turmoil, the longer we have more um, mental health problems in our area, the longer we have families breaking up, the, the more we have people wanting to leave the city because they can't get back here to begin with. So I need you to help take that back and talk about our needs. Um, Lillowood has gone through an awful lot as well, and we don't want to be another Lillowood. And I just want to ensure that even though you may not have policy, there should be able to be some access for our citizens. They deserve that at the very least. And I, I would hope that you could take that back um, to the powers that be. Thank you. And thank you, Mayor. Um, so you know your your uh, competent city team and Greg have impressed that upon me and my team, and uh, we have taken that back, and we are continuing to have conversations about what we can do to expedite a process to provide some in-community um, supports. You know, I know that the city is working with BC Housing on some some opportunities, but it's too long a horizon to help the people right now. So we're we're trying to find what we can do as soon as we possibly can and and if not in in finding some access to the in community supports um ability perhaps we can dip into that five billion that is sitting waiting um in this nice little pocket we need access to those funds thank you message heard thank you thanks mayor brown and thanks for uh for chiming in and and being a part of this uh conversation tonight ray i'm trying to be cognizant of, of time and also in the spirit of public information i just want to make sure that we do get to address some of the uh as many as we can the questions that were sent in from the community members and mayor brown if i may pick up on on your last comment and just remind folks that are watching that there are uh, supports, mental health supports that uh, may be available that if uh, if you contact the support center, connect with uh, with Linda's team at the rail at the rail yard mall and uh, they would be more than happy to help connect you with the right people. It's important that we take care of ourselves and take care of others while we're going through this thing. So um, know that there's resources there for you. Um, let's, uh, Red Cross, I just want to ask, um, this question and it's, I think it's kind of a neat one. And, and one of the community members is saying that they've been assigned a case manager from the Red Cross. Uh, and they've said it's all been very, very helpful and they're very appreciative of, of the help and the assistance. Um, but they're just having a difficult time connecting back to that case manager. So if I call a 1-800 number, I'm, you know, just in the in the system is there a way that somebody can connect directly with the case manager they've been working with who understand their needs uh, so that they can provide them with uh, with an update yeah thanks ben for the question um if people are looking to reach back to their case managers and aren't able to um, although we would encourage that as a primary mechanism um, to reach back in. Um, then they also have the ability to uh, email at the BC flood recovery at redcross.ca um, and identify um, their needs and a case manager will uh, reach back out to them as soon as they can. Great, thanks very much. And uh, I know DFA, I told you to ask you if you could stick around. Um, so, this question is for you, Nadine, and this is, uh, if a DFA application was submitted prior to February 14th, but DFA does not receive the stamped insurance form before that date, is the DFA application still considered incomplete? Like, will it just be processed if the insurance form is submitted later? So uh, I hope you understand that. 
question. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the reason that we have the insurance template form on the website is just to expedite the process. Um, normally we get the application in, um, we contact the applicant and then at that time we request the insurance template form. We just wanted it to be available um, for people just to kind of try and get their ducks in a row as fast as possible so that they can get pushed through the process as fast as possible. But um, just get your applications into us. You do not need to get your insurance template form to us before the application deadline. Um, if you can, that's, that's great. Um, but if you can't, there's no worries. We're going to work with you to get that insurance template form sent back as, as soon as you're able. Once you get the, your applications into us and we have a file open for you, that's, there's no more deadline. It's just on your own time. Like we know that people want to receive help as fast as possible. But getting documents to us um, and anything that we requ request from you is is on your own time. Great, thank you. Um, this one, I, it's either a Greg Selecki or a Linda Brick question, um, and it kind of uh, it, it's a question about people that just want to return to merit. I want to come back to merit because my job is here, or I want to work on my home or I want to do something, but I can't find a place to stay. There's just not accommodation available. And as much as I want to come and work and, and start the process, there's nowhere for me to stay. And so is there any, is there any suggestion, any quick win or just a, have you thought about that, that we might be able to offer up at this time? I can address that one for you. Um, what I've heard is that there are some people that are choosing to go and rent campers like trailer vans or trailers and parking them on their property. And that might be one, a solution for some people. There are places in Kamloops that are renting out campers and we can provide the contact information for those places here at the Merit Support Centre. But that's an option that some people have taken advantage of just as a way to bring their family back together and to come back to the city and be close to their homes so that they can start working on their homes and be in this community again. That's a, that's a neat suggestion actually. Um, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Red Cross. Um, somebody is curious if the Red Cross is using the evacuation order list to determine who to support or how much to support somebody. So are, is that a reference point for you at all based on what that evac order list is stating? Uh, is that helping influence your decisions? Yeah, um, thanks Ben. So um, the short answer is no. Um, our supports are really based on um, those who have registered uh, with the Red Cross and identified that need um, throughout the relief and uh, coming into recovery. Um, and so personalized recovery supports are really available for anyone um, who have registered with the Red Cross and identified um, those needs within the recovery phase. Um, and then determination of assistance is really on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, based off of the needs identified um, with individuals when they're speaking with their case manager. And a case manager would work um, with those individuals based on, on their unique uh, circumstances and situation um, to support. Great, thank you. Um, and then I, the last question, I know we're kind of over time, so I appreciate uh, everybody hanging out here. So I just want to go to the last question. I just want to also remind folks that if you did not hear your exact question, we tried to lump like questions together. Um, and, and if we didn't address your question tonight, it's because the, the, the best person to answer that question uh, was not here this evening. So we will uh, keep those questions and look to address them through other means, the next public information session or uh, through a return email is, uh, is another option that we can if we connect you with the right people. But this is to Greg. Um, and, and some folks are, are wondering, is the city going to be purchasing homes? Um, you know, for, for some of the homeowners who have said, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to spend money on repairing and, and remediation. And I'm just, you know, is, is it an option that the city would come in and, uh, and buy some of the homes that have been impacted by the flood, Greg? 
Yeah, that's really tough. And I can't imagine the, 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 the stress with some of the people trying to determine what to do with that. And I think that question probably comes from uh, what we've seen in the past or what people have heard of, of what has occurred in places like Grand Forks, BC, or even High River, Alberta, where a uh, combination of uh, partnerships and, and, and different plans in place with the federal government, provincial governments, and with support from the city, they've gone to that extent. Um, that comes uh, later. Uh, I mentioned earlier the the critical infrastructure that we're dealing with and the discovery phase of all these pieces of an infrastructure also has to take into account the floodplain and it's a new floodplain. So what exactly you know does that mean and what does it mean to the homes that would be bordering in that area? Uh, and and that's going to be a, a determining factor for sure uh, to those programs uh, that the federal provincial governments and and in 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 partnership with the city would be able to identify. So at this time, it, it's going to take a while before that's going to occur, and and the people have to make a calculated decision on the long timeline uh, before that could even uh, happen and be in place. And and uh, this is one of my own questions, and I'm I'm just thinking like, you know, somebody joining on YouTube, can you explain what you mean by critical infrastructure? Because mm. um, you know, if if my focus, you know, rebuild this, re and, and just provide maybe some context to what critical critical infrastructure means from an emergency management recovery perspective. Yeah, they're they're the underlying uh, segments uh, of uh, um, different pieces of, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, things like utilities, uh, roadways that support society. So uh, what I'm what I'm trying to say is, when you look at the roadways, uh, when you look at uh, water treatment facilities, wastewater facilities, all of those things that help us. Uh, exist within a city, uh, those pieces of uh, um, uh, functioning materials, those areas, even where we play, where we go to school, the hospitals, uh, all of those are critical infrastructure. So critical to our well-being, crit critical to our community, and we want to maintain that. Um, of course, uh, the hospital was not impacted, but the schools were, the roadways were, the sidewalks were, the bridge was, uh, um, the, the wastewater treatment facility was as well. So we do have a lot of that critical infrastructure, critical to the community, infrastructure in general that needs to be um, uh, looked at closely and then even prioritized on how we want to move forward in repairing that. And I think I mentioned, you know, parks, I always come back to that, but that's a segment, you know, we want to be able to take our walk. We want to be able to go back to the uh, park with our, our dogs and our kids in the playgrounds and, and use them. So as long as it may take to repair some of that uh, larger infrastructure, like a roadway, like a bridge, um, if we're moving at the same time, uh, it might be an, a very beneficial for uh, the park to be done so that we can start using things like, uh, like that uh, within the community. Great. Thank you for that explanation. Um, that helps. Uh, Mr. Smith, with our final question for tonight, and then we'll go back to the mayor uh, to to close up. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Sean Smith, CAO from the City of Merritt here. I just wanted to add a little bit of extra context to the discussion around whether people should be investing in their homes and, and rebuilding, or is the, um, the city going to be looking at some options for uh, potentially purchasing homes that are in floodplain? Uh, what I would really say, because I know that there's been a lot of confusing information on this, um, is that, yes, this is one of the options that's going to be explored. Um, we're, we'd be remiss not to look at that to be able to say, how can we mitigate damage for the future uh, as we have increased frequency and severity of, of events? Um, for sure, it's something that's going to be looked at. But don't let that stop you from doing the work necessary to get back into your home. Um, and the reason I say this uh, is that 
Right now, there, there isn't certainty as to what any process would look like, as Greg indicated. This is very likely months, and in the case of, say, Grand Forks, it's, it's years down the road. Um, and so, uh, let's take the Grand Forks example. When they ended up coming forward with some form of solution, that included not just the value of the home, but it included the value of the post-flood repair works as well. And so, those people were compensated uh, for the, the investment that they made in their home after the flood. Now, does that mean that that's the exact same solution that would be implemented in Merritt? We can't promise that. That's absolutely not where we're at. Uh, but we can tell you that as a city, if a solution like that were uh, to be on the table, that's certainly what we would be advocating for. Um, we recognize that you have to get back into your home and we don't want to be the ones that stop you from getting there. Please do what is right for you. If that is spending uh, in, in order to repair or in, invest in your homes, even if that is within the floodplain area, take the measures that are, are necessary for you. Rely on those programs that are in place, DFA, uh, potentially other supports through the Red Cross, um, accessing through the uh, support center, um, connecting with, with Rotary or potentially other funds as well. Do what, what's right for you um, and know that we will be looking at the bigger question of floodplain expropriation potentially, um, but that that process isn't going to be something that should stop you from making a decision to get back in your house today. Just wanted to add that that feedback, Your Worship. Thanks very much. And uh, Nadine has uh, from EMBC just has a response to that as well. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight something based on what Sean said. Um, for DFA, um, please don't wait to do any repairs to your home um, because we can assess damage both before and after you do repairs. So do whatever you need to to repair your home. Um, we just ask that you take photos, keep any invoices or receipts that are related to your repairs um, in order to help us with assessing the damage after the fact. But I just wanted to, to throw that out there. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening, uh, for sharing information. Sharing information is one of the underpinning hallmarks of, of recovery. And uh, as information becomes available, uh, the city will do their best to make it available to, to you, the community. Uh, and it's so great to have representatives from key organizations that have been supporting Maritonians like the folks, the ladies from the Red Cross who joined us tonight, uh, our guests from EMBC, and of course, Mayor and Council. So with that, Mayor, if you'd like to close it up and then we will say, uh, we'll say good night. Thank you. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. Um, we'll have another session like this uh, as soon as we have more information to provide to you. Um, just know that city and council are working hard to have adequate housing or any housing at this point um, for our affected residents. And as soon as we have provincial approval, uh, which we're still waiting for, we are on it. Um, we continue to work with numerous departments and agencies of the provincial and federal governments to look for funding for our city critical infrastructure as Greg referred to earlier. Um, so we don't expect this burden to fall on the local taxpayers. Um, and we also, for the 20% required for the private citizen to, to look at um, when the funding is available for 80% to you, there are numerous donations being provided through the Merit Rotary and also to the upcoming music fundraiser on March 13th, the Hell or High Water. Uh, that will help or should help with some of the funding required for residents who can't afford that 20 percent uh, how much and and who uh, would be eligible for it is yet to be determined if you still have unanswered questions i remind you that any of us on council would be happy to lend a helping hand to try to find out what it is you need and if we can't help you then we'll find somebody who can help you but we do encourage you to provide or to try the um, support center first um, but if, if, if you have questions, feel free to come to any one of us. Just a reminder that this current session will be live streamed to the Merit YouTube channel and uh, to our merit.ca website. And I, I hope I'm correct in stating that it'll be on the merit.ca website. 
But if you know of anybody who needs this information or who can benefit from it, please uh, point them towards the website and uh, have them review the video. Again, thank you for joining us. Uh, be kind, stay safe, and good night.